Hi, I'm Dr. Shaw. Um, what is that? That's I'm part of the Sign Maryland River yes, Clinic. If you could sign in, please. My nurse, Brain, Michelle Beck, email. and our Hi. office manager, Lisa Yellen. Hi. And we're here today to talk about the non-surgical treatment of hemorrhoids. Just a little chops. And specifically hemorrhoidal banding, which is becoming a really wonderful alternative to surgery. So what are hemorrhoids? Hemorrhoids are actually normal vascular structures that are in your rectum. And they only cause symptoms if they become swollen or irritated. Who wants this? Hemorrhoids oh, I don't give you my email. are actually vascular connections inside the walls of the rectum. And you can see how this hemorrhoid jet. This is a hemorrhoid that could be seen on the outside, and this is a hemorrhoid more, in, more in, internal, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So these, these are not abnormal. Everyone has hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids only become a problem when they cause symptoms. So what are the symptoms? The symptoms of hemorrhoids are, and I'm sure we've all experienced them, burning, itching, bleeding, prolapse, which is when the hemorrhoid actually comes out, and you can see it on the outside of the rectum, tissue bulging around the anus, leaking of feces, and difficulty cleaning after a bowel movement. And this is usually what brings people in. The bleeding can be very frightening. A small amount of blood in a toilet bowl will disperse very quickly, and that can be very frightening. So seeing blood in the toilet can be really frightening. Um, the itching, the burning, those are, you know, irritating kind of symptoms. But a lot of patients do come in complaining that they can't clean around their, their anus, so the, around their rectum after a bowel movement. And the reason for this is hemorrhoids actually serve a function. They have a function of helping continence and helping stool from leaking. So when they prolapse, when they come out, they can cause irritation around the perianal area, um, mucousy discharge, uh, they get very, very itchy, and they can cause difficulty with keeping yourself clean. And so if people have difficulty cleaning themselves, they may even be more aggressive. And, and sometimes cleaning too much can be a problem. So what kind of blood comes from hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoidal bleeding is different than other types of bleeding. You can bleed from a lot of different uh, sources, and so it's really important anytime you have bleeding to see your doctor. Typically, hemorrhoidal ble bleeding is bright red blood, like a nosebleed, like a fresh cut. It's bright red blood. It's usually on the outside of the stool, or you'll see it on the toilet tissue when you wipe, or you might see it in the toilet water. Um, it's usually painless, but not always. When there's pain, something else may be going on, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So most bright red blood is hemorrhoidal, but as I said, you really need to see your doctor, because if you haven't had any kind of recent evaluation, you can't just assume it's a hemorrhoid. So what are the risk factors for hemorrhoids? This doesn't look like a happy situation. <laughs> so who gets hemorrhoids? It's usually an older population. As we get older, collagen and support tissues in the anus break down, and so it makes it more common for people to have symptomatic hemorrhoids. People who tend to be chronically constipated or have a hard stool, a um, lot of pressure, that will cause swelling and prolapse of your hemorrhoids. Diarrhea can also be a problem because the more activity in the area, the greater the likelihood you might have swelling and irritation. People who are obese, who sit for prolonged periods of time, who strain to have a bowel movement, who sit on the commode long periods of time. That's not a good thing to do. Um, pregnant women and people with pelvic tumors. So there are a couple of types of hemorrhoids. And this is important when it comes to treatment because banding is appropriate for internal hemorrhoids but not for external hemorrhoids. For many problematic external hemorrhoids, it may come to seeing a, a rectal surgeon. So hemorrhoids that are on the outside are usually external hemorrhoids. These originate below this line. This line is called the dentate line, and it's a, very important, it's a very important part of your anatomy because below that line, you have innervation. So below here, you're going to feel pain. Above here, you're not. And that's why internal hemorrhoids are so amenable to banding because you don't, they don't feel sensation. You don't feel pain with internal hemorrhoids. So external hemorrhoids can be very painful. Internal hemorrhoids can look like external if they prolapse or fall out of the rectum. So sometimes you might not see an internal hemorrhoid. You may see nothing at all on the outside but bleeding. So internal hemorrhoids can bleed, but when they fall into the anal canal and outside, then they become visible. They're still internal hemorrhoids, and they're not 
innervated in the same way. So you won't see an internal hemorrhoid unless they prolapse. And internal hemorrhoids are graded four different types. This is sort of technical stuff that you don't really need to know. But type one and two, you usually don't see. Type two, when you press to have a bowel movement, it might pop out, but it'll pop back in. Type three pops out, and you actually have to take your finger and push it back up. Mm. These are the three types of hemorrhoids that are treatable with the banding procedure we're going to talk about today. Type four, prolapse, and you can't push them back in. Those are the most serious type, and if they don't respond to local therapy, which we'll talk about in a minute, you might have to have surgery with that type of a hemorrhoid. So what do we do first? First, we, of course, always take a conservative approach. We don't want to go doing surgery. We don't want to be banding people unnecessarily. So the most important thing is to treat the constipation. We want to make sure that people are getting enough fiber. <coughs> now, the amount of fiber we recommend for people is huge, 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day. When they say four to five servings of fruits, vegetables, or whole grains, it's very unrealistic when you figure an apple is about three grams of fiber. So to really get the amount of fiber in your diet every day, you usually need to use a fiber supplement, something like Metamucil, Citrusil, Fibrocon, Benafiber. There are many different fibers available, and I'm sure Michael can help you find one here. But people tolerate fiber differently. Some people tolerate Benafiber, but they don't tolerate Metamucil. And, and, and so it's a very individual thing that you have to play around with. The goal is to start with about three grams of fiber and work your way up. If you go too fast, people tend to get bloated and uncomfortable. So fiber is a very you know, individualized kind of thing. Prunes are great. That's where your dietary fiber comes in. Prunes are about seven grams of fiber, which is terrific when you figure that, you know, as I said, an apple is about three and, and most other fruits aren't that much. The problem with prunes is sometimes they make people gassy. So once again, just like with your diet, and your fiber supplements, you really have to individualize this. The goal is to soften up the stool, to increase the fiber in your diet, and to, to not press, to not push. So stool softeners are another part of this. Things called docusate, um, uh, the trade names of those are colase, um, per diem, dulcolex. You know, you have to be careful also because you'll see a trade name, you have to read the labels, very important. Um, because some things that say Ducalex on them aren't just a stool softener, they could also have a laxative in them. And we're not going to touch laxatives just yet. So the goal is to treat the constipation. Fiber, stool softeners, and then also to, to help improve blood flow and to decrease any spasm in the area, we recommend sit spas. And that's actually sitting in a tub with a couple of inches of water, sitting there two or three times a day for about 10 to 15 minutes. Now, some people have difficulty with mobility, and not so easy to get in and out of the tub. It's also pretty time consuming. So I'm sure King's Pharmacy has actual sits baths that fit over the toilet, or they can order them for you, and you just put a little bit of water in there and you just sit in there. If you have a bidet, it's also nice, or a handheld shower. But sitting in nice warm water is very soothing. Increases blood flow, decreases swelling, and it decreases spasm of that inter internal anal sphincter, which contributes to hemorrhoids. <coughs> Don't put anything in the sitz baths. Don't put any kind of Epsom salt or anything else. Just plain, nice, warm water. The other part of that is don't use over-the-counter wipes. They have perfumes. They have additives. They, in and of themselves, can cause irritation. So be careful what you're using. There are many creams and ointments that are um, available to treat hemorrhoids. Um, cleansers are fine. Just you know, talk to your pharmacist. Make sure that what you're using is not causing more harm than, than, than good. There are various analgesics. Um, some of them are prescription, like promoxine. There's lidocaine. There are various things that can decrease the pain while you're treating the, the hemorrhoid themselves. And then there's anti-inflammatory creams. You can use over-the-counter hydrocortisone, but only short term. That's 1% hydrocortisone, and you can use a little around the anus. But I wouldn't do it for more than a week, because hydrocortisone interferes with healing, can break down tissue, and can actually, once again, cause more harm than good. If these over-the-counter things don't work, then you need to talk to your doctor because your doctor can prescribe a higher percentage of hydrocortisone. We usually prescribe 2.5%. Once again, these aren't long-term fixes. These are short-term things because hydrocortisone has problems in and of themselves if you use it on a long-term basis. All right, so if these more conservative approaches don't work, what do we do next? There are a number of different approaches that we use. Um, 
rubber band ligation, which we'll talk about in a moment, infrared coagulation, um, which I used to do quite a bit of, and it sends light waves into the hemorrhoid and it destroys the tissue. And it allows the blood flow to be cut off and scarring and it tacks the hemorrhoid down to the underlying muscle and it helps heal it. Infrared coagulation works, but the recurrence rate is greater. Other options, laser therapy. Laser tends to be expensive and it has some potential complications, comparatively speaking to the rubber band ligation. Cryosurgery, that's using um, cold to freeze the hemorrhoid. Sclerotherapy is injecting chemicals into the hemorrhoid. Um, those things, in general, the success rate is going to be better with rubber band ligation. Patient satisfaction is higher. We'll talk about the details of rubber band ligation, but this has pretty much become the standard of care in, in um, when conservative treatment doesn't work, rubber band ligation is usually your next step. When these things don't work, or if you have a grade four hemorrhoid or a thrombosis external hemorrhoid or something more serious, then you're talking about surgery. And when you're talking about surgery, you're talking about valve preps, anesthesia, surgical suite costs and time, surgical times, it's a lot bigger deal. We certainly try to avoid surgery at all costs, but in some cases, surgery is appropriate. So let's talk about the procedure itself, the hemorrhoidal banding. Uh, do we have, uh, oh yeah, okay. So I have a picture of, of what this actually looks like. Um, so there's a little teeny rubber band is placed around the base of the internal hemorrhoid, and what that does is it cuts off the supply to the hemorrhoid. After about three or four days, the hemorrhoid will shrink and the rubber band will fall off. You may or may not see that. What you can see at that time is maybe a little spotting of blood. So you shouldn't be alarmed if about two, three, four days after you've, you're banded, if you see a little bit of bleeding. You can also see a little bit of bleeding maybe seven to 10 days after because the area actually ulcerates and the tissue sloughs or falls off. So a little bit of bleeding after banding is not uncommon. The great thing about banding is it doesn't hurt, not more than a rectal exam. Um, because you have to put the tool in, and I'll show you what it looks like. Um, so it's virtually pain-free. It's not the banding that hurts, because the internal hemorrhoid has no innervation. We already talked about how internal hemorrhoid don't hurt. Um, the physical part of, of putting the instrument in might cause some discomfort if you have some anal irritation, or if you have a very tight sphincter. Um, you don't have to do a bowel preparation. You don't have to do like a colon prep for this. This can be done. You drive there, you drive home, no sedation is required. You do it right in the doctor's office so you don't have the cost of an ambulatory surgery center. There's no downtime. I tell my patients not to strain or, you know, go play a heavy game of tennis after, but really other than, you know, using good sense, you know, not using uh, excessive amounts of Aleve, Advil, Motrin or, or heavy lifting or anything like that, there really is no downtime at all. Um, typically, we do three sessions, and the reason for that is there's three main hemorrhoidal chains. And by banding those three chains, you get their 80 to 90% resolution of any symptoms. And we'll go more, about, more into the, um, you know, the, the statistics in a moment. So typically, we do these three areas two to three weeks apart. And cost varies based on your insurance. That's, that's a really individual thing um, that my office manager can, can provide you with the, the cost of that. This is the banding apparatus, and it's basically like a syringe. It's just a plastic syringe that's a little bit thicker than my thumb. It goes in the anus, I suck up the hemorrhoids, and I just pop a band on it. People really usually feel nothing. If there's any discomfort, I'll put a finger in and I'll loosen up the band. And usually people, I won't let people leave my office if they have any discomfort at all. You can feel a little rectal pressure for about a day or so. Sometimes it sits baths or a little lever Advil, not a lot, um, but that will usually clear that up within 24 hours. Okay, so what are the complications? This sounds too good to be true. Well, the complication rate is actually very low. Pain is about 8%, and severe pain is probably lower than that. You should not feel severe pain because we already said there's no nerves in this area. If you do feel pain, it could be because um, too much tissue is clipped and it has to be loosened up, or you're below that line where you're, you're not supposed to be. So if you follow your landmarks properly, pain is, is a really, really uncommon um, phenomenon. Bleeding, significant bleeding is only about one to 2%. We talked about a little bit of spotting, maybe when the rubber band falls off, 
or when that tissue sloughs off at seven to 10 days. You can have clotting of other hemorrhoids. That happens, but it's infrequent. Urinary retention, also a potential side effect we have to mention, but I haven't seen it. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So recurrence rate is low, and I looked at a various number of studies, meta-analyses of looking over a large number of studies, and recurrence rate is maybe 10 to 30%. Patient satisfaction is very high, 90%. People are happy with this procedure. It's simple, it's easy, it doesn't take a lot of preparation or post-op care. What we do do postoperatively is we have to avoid constipation. This is going to, you know, basically, this is going to ruin anything that we've accomplished. So you want to continue to use your fiber supplement, continue to use your stool softeners, your high fiber diet. You don't want to sit on the commode for long periods of time. When you get the urge to have a bowel movement, you go, you have your bowel movement, you get off the toilet. Don't um, ever um, suppress the urge to have a bowel movement. That's where chronic constipation takes off. When, when the stool drops into the rectum, it stretches the rectum out, that sends a signal to your brain, it's time to go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. If you're in the mall, if you're in Publix, find, find the bathroom, go to the bathroom. It's, it's more important that you listen to your body. Um, again, you, you, post-banding, you should avoid hydrocortisone-containing products because I mentioned before, hydrocortisone can interfere with healing. We want to be able to allow that band to clot off the hemorrhoid and allow it to heal properly. I also prescribe nitroglycerin ointment post-procedure because spasm can make healing uh, less effective. Um, now, it's a very small amount of nitroglycerin. It's about a pea size. We usually prescribe it three times a day. Occasionally, people will get a headache and we back off. It usually doesn't interfere with anything cardiac. Um, if there are any concerns or issues, we can discuss it with your cardiologist. Okay, so in summary, Hemorrhoidal banding is appropriate to treat bleeding and symptoms from grade 1, 2, and 3 internal hemorrhoids. Just remember the, that chart. So hemorrhoids you don't see, hemorrhoids that prolapse with the bowel movement, or hemorrhoids that prolapse and you have to push back up with your finger. Banding is safe with a low risk of complications. It requires no bowel preparation, no anesthesia. It's virtually pain-free. It's very effective, and it's cost-effective with no downtime. That's something that maybe you can't really fix with hemorrhoidal band. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a baboon. baboon's behind. A what? A baboon's behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't usually ban people. Yeah. Right. You know, He's got a problem. Yeah. He's got a big problem. <laughs> so if your hemorrhoids are bothering you, please call us for a consultation. Any questions? Yes. Are you listed as one of the possible complications if you do the banding? is clotting of another hemorrhoid. And what does that mean? Thrombosis or clotting of other hemorrhoids? Right, you could irritate other hemorrhoids, potentially, mm -hmm. by clotting off the blood supply to one. And then if it's irritated, what, what, what happens? You, you start at, at point one. You do your same stool softener, you do your sitz baths. You, you, away. Treat, you treat those. You treat those the same way you would with the initial one. There's no prep like you do for a colonoscopy or a Not unless you want to, no. <laughs> There's no bowel prep. You don't, no, just, no laxative prep, no. Nothing no. at all. Yes. <clears throat> I was told that I need to go to a proctologist. When does the proctologist come in and when do you come in? Well, the proctologist does this as well. Colorectal surgeons, which are proctologists, have been doing banding for years. Um, it's now become available to gastroenterologists as a modality to treat our patients. When they're grade four, when they're prolapsed and you can't push them up, that's when you really need to see a surgeon, a colorectal surgeon. And that's a more in-depth procedure with you know, real surgery and, and real recovery time. So if you have a thrombosed external hemorrhoid, if you have a grade four hemorrhoid, those are situations where maybe a colorectal surgeon needs to see you first. Thank you. How do you know if you have internal hemorrhoids? What are the signs? The so you might not see anything at all. You could just see bleeding. You won't see anything on the outside of the anus, but some people have both internal and external, so it's hard to tell where the bleeding is coming from. If you don't see anything on the outside, or if you see something prolapsing out, or something that you can push back up, that's an internal hemorrhoid. Because many years ago I had a colonoscopy, and the, and the doctor said at that time that I have internal hemorrhoids. And you hemorrhoids. were surprised. Well, does everybody have it or? Everyone has internal hemorrhoids. 
Everybody has them. They're normal vascular structures. But when they get symptomatic, then you do something about it. So just because they found an internal hemorrhoid on your colonoscopy, you don't have to do anything about it. You don't do anything about it unless it's bothering you. If it's itching or burning or bleeding or causing difficulty cleaning yourself, that's when you do something about it. I wouldn't treat an, a, a, an asymptomatic hemorrhoid. Even if you see it prolapsing and it's not bothering you, I wouldn't necessarily do a thing about it. Can I make an appointment now for tomorrow? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you have a customer tomorrow? Excuse me? I'll be there tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow's my scoping day, but you can come Thursday. <laughs> oh, okay. Call us tomorrow. We'll make an appointment. We'd be happy to see you. Okay. And I'm in, in the office right here. Um, on Executive Executive Drive? Enterprise yeah. Center Boulevard. Enterprise Center Boulevard. I knew it was something that <laughs> okay. sounds important. Um, <laughs> we have an office here that I'm in Friday mornings, and we're always okay. happy to fit people in. So oh, if you so call and they say we have no spots, don't believe them. We can always fit you in. Okay. Ask to speak to me. Yes. Michelle, <laughs> my girl. Michelle or Lisa. Okay. If anybody goes, don't hesitate. She's the best. <laughs> Thank you. I know my very good. Advocate. She's my what patient. She's done. one of my loveliest patients. Huh? She always what brings us great you snacks. You brought a shill. I said, right? Did you spot somebody, you somebody in the audience? I have more than that. Oh, <laughs> well, at least no hecklers. See, huh? And not only that, she's cute. <laughs> very. <laughs> well, thanks all. Thank you all for coming. Okay. It's really a pleasure. Very informative. Thank you very much. And what, what, what kind of a doctor are you, man? I'm a gastroenterologist, so I do colonoscopies oh, and upper endoscopies and screening. Yes. I got you. I'm older. Yes, sir. Do you uh, treat IBS? Uh, Absolutely. I have a lot of IBS patients. And I think the reason for that is that as a female, I'm maybe a little more empathetic. I do a lot more hand holding than a lot of the guys. I see a lot of patients who the male doctors have sort of. I can't do anything for you, you know, has to have sort of discharged from their practice, you know, they scoped them, they did, you know, everything I possibly can, I, have, I can't offer you anything else. I see a lot of those kind of patients because we're very hands-on, we're, we're, we're very, very concerned about our patients. We take a lot of time with our patients and we spend a lot of time with our patients and irritable bowel is, is very difficult, it's very mm -hmm. tough, you know, just because you can't see irritable bowel in a colonoscopy doesn't mean that it doesn't disrupt someone's life, you know, dramatically. Yeah, we've been to doctors where they look at their watch and say, no, it's, somebody coming. There's right nothing after. else I can do for you, right? They do their fiber and their antispasmodics and they, uh, after they scope you, of course. So, right. no, we're, we're very, we have a very, very big practice of IBS patients, a big female practice. I see a lot of patients from the female docs and the, the OBGYNs. It's just, it's a different kind of practice. Very hands-on. Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.